Good evening. Anytime you folks want to start an argument that will drag into the wee small hours, just bring up the subject of the steamer Portland, the Marie Celeste, or the names of the mass on the Thomas W. Lawson. We've covered the Portland pretty well. The Marie Celeste is coming up for discussion in the near future. And right now I am going to spin a yarn about the loss of the Lawson just 37 years ago yesterday on Friday the 13th of December, 1907. I'm rather proud of the fact that this is the first time this eyewitness account of the Lawson wreck has ever been told. If I ever do get around to publishing these Yankee yarns in book form, you can be sure I shall include these copyrighted stories of the Lawson. You all know, of course, that the Thomas W. Lawson was the world's biggest sailing vessel. She was 375 feet long, had a 50-foot beam, was 35 feet deep, and when loaded, drew 26 feet of water. Unlike most big schooners, which are built of wood, the Lawson was made of steel. Her great hull and her three decks were steel, and so were the seven giant masts that towered 135 feet above the deck and were topped off with 56-foot spars of Oregon pine. The Lawson carried 40,617 square feet of heavy-duty canvas sails that were hoisted up and hauled down by steam engines ranged along the deck. The Lawson was steered by steam and had a generating plant that furnished electric light and power. Old-time sea captains couldn't believe their eyes when they went aboard and saw electric lights and fans and steam radiators in the cabins and crew's quarters. In many respects, this great beautiful ship was characteristic of the men for whom she was named. A lot of good men sailed on the Lawson at one time or another, and last summer in Rockland, Maine, I talked to one of them, Captain Charles McGee, who was, for a spell, the Lawson's first mate. Captain McGee denies the oft-repeated remark that the Lawson was too big and unwieldy. She was the sweetest ship I ever sailed on, he said reverently. Why, I've sailed on that schooner when we had 10,000 tons of soft coal under our decks, and with all sails set and a fair wind, we'd skip along at 15 knots an hour. Right here, I want to mention two other famous Yankee captains, the Crowleys, Captain Arthur and Captain John, because they had a lot to do with the construction and sailing of the world's only seven-masted ship. For the first four years of her life, the Lawson plied between Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York in the coal trade for the Coastwise Transportation Company, and she made a lot of money for her owners. In March 1906, she was leased to the Sun Oil Company. They shortened her topmasts and fitted great tanks into the hull to carry oil in bulk from Port Arthur, Texas to New York. Once again, she made handsome profits. And I've heard that in the first five years, the Lawson paid for herself three times over. On November 19, 1907, she sailed from Philadelphia, loaded with oil, on what proved to be her first and last trip across the Atlantic. Her skipper at the time was Captain George W. Dow of Melrose, an old-time, experienced, deep-water man. And besides the captain, there were a first and second mate, two engineers, a cook and mess boy, and a crew of 12 sailors. Only two of those men survived when the great seven-master ran aground on the silly islands off lands and England in a wild winter hurricane. They were Captain George W. Dow and Engineer Edward Rowe, formerly of Machias, Maine. I am going to give you the details of that fatal wreck, just as Mr. Rowe gave them to me. As I said before, the Lawson sailed from Philly on November 19, 1907, bound for England with a cargo of oil. She was towed out and stood on the starboard tack with a strong east wind as they headed toward Hatteras. That night, the wind shifted south, and they tacked sharp to starboard. Then it shifted again, swung around to northwest, and commenced to blow like the devil. They had all sails set and were making about 20 knots. Things didn't look too good to engineer, row, so he went to the skipper and suggested that they take off some of the rags. But all they took in was topsails and spanker, leaving the six mainsails and jibs. The breeze turned into a gale, and away they went, passing tramp steamers like they were anchored. When the gale reached 75 miles an hour, one of the big sails ripped clean off the mast with a report like cannon fire. The Lawson was off the Grand Banks then, and one after another, those enormous sheets let go, bang, 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 flying in tatters and rags to the four winds of heaven, leaving the Lawson with just her trysail on the foremast and the mainsail. As soon as the sails went, she began to ship water, and in no time, heavy seas were smashing across her steel decks from bow to stern. One big wave knocked number six hatch in, and the pumps were started. Now, the Lawson was big and high, and her tall metal mass offered so much resistance to the wind along with the rigging, she kept right on going. Not 20 knots, of course, but she did make six or seven. At one time, the wind velocity registered 107 miles an hour, and they were being blown straight across the Atlantic with bare sticks. 
For days, the Larson plowed on toward the coast of England. Then on December the 13th, the winds died down, and they raised new trysails. But with calmer weather, fog came to blot out everything. When suddenly the temperature tumbled, the fog disappeared, and low clouds brought snow and stinging sleet. They didn't know they'd been blown nearly 100 miles off their course. In that driving, blinding blizzard, they didn't know where they were. And as the wind increased again from a new quarter, it carried a low rumbling like thunder. The sound of surf, but they didn't know it. What had looked like a low-hanging cloud to Captain Dow was actually a cliff rising above the Lawson's Mass, a perpendicular cliff with small sheep houses and trees on it. And they were under it, grounding, lifting free, dragging, hitting again. They dropped first one anchor and then the other, but it was too late. Closer and closer, the Lawson dragged toward the ledges, then swung so sharp, one of the crew named Allen was hurled from the deck right over onto the rocks. He climbed up, fell back, and died. A Coast Guard boat sent to help the Lawson got a line aboard the stern, but it broke. Two other boats started from Plymouth, England, but had to turn back. This was the night of Friday the 13th, and the Lawson was doomed. According to Engineer Rowe, she broke up sometime between midnight Friday and 3 a.m. the next morning. In the tumult of crashing spars and wrenching steel, shrinking winds and pounding surf, the engineer remembers only that he was standing on the shear pole when a towering wall of water swept him overboard into the icy, oil-covered ocean. He came to the surface covered with oil. It clotted his hair, filled his eyes and mouth and made him sick. He was almost hit by the seventh mast when it crashed into the foam, carrying with it the half-frozen figures of Captain Dow, the pilot who had come aboard a short time before, the mate, the cook, and the cabin boy. Only Captain Dow came to the surface, and then he disappeared from view. Unable to swim a stroke, the engineer reached for floating timber, a piece of centerline bulkhead 12 by 12 and 30 feet long. It had sharp iron spikes, so he grabbed one and held on. He was now perhaps 200 feet away from the Lawson, and as he looked back, he saw her giant hull, stripped bare of mass and rigging, looming above him like a brick block. All her lights were still burning. The next time he looked, she turned over like a dishpan, and the lights went out. It was very dark and very cold. When the engineer went overboard, he had on a thin blue serge suit that was immediately soaked with oil. He got free of his clothes and kicked off his shoes. He was chilled to the bone, and he knew he couldn't hang on to that timber very much longer. The nearest land, he figured, was the coast of France, 80 miles away. I must have drifted for a couple of hours, he said, when I felt bottom under my feet and saw some sharp rocks sticking up out of the surf. I thought if I could get hold of them, I might hang on till the tide went out. So I let go of the timber and was immediately rolled over and over by the surf. I was cut and bruised and all banged up. My clothes was ripped to shreds. And I was bleeding from head to foot and so numb I could barely move. Mr. Rowe paused and passed his hand over his eyes to blot out the picture of those ugly ledges and the memory of that awful night. I crawled from one rock to another, he said. There'd be three seas go over me and then a breathing spell. My underclothes was ripped to shreds, and I was bleeding badly. But I saw a rocky con up ahead with a shelf on it. And when a big breaker boiled in, I let go, and it smacked me right up against the ledge. And I hung on to it for dear life. It was awful cold. Around 8 o'clock, he went on, I saw something floating below me, and it looked like a body. So I crawled down to the beach and got hold of it. It was Captain Dow, and he was still alive. He'd tied a raincoat around his neck, and that kept him afloat. The tide was coming in again, and I was awful weak. But I managed to get his legs over my shoulders and started for higher ground. But the heavy surf knocked me down. And that's where I broke both knee joints. I couldn't get up at all then. So the two of us just laid there helpless on the hard rocks with the water washing over us. Both of those men would have frozen before another dawn if a boat from St. Agnes hadn't come along looking for wreckage from the Lawson. They could only take one man aboard. So they got a line around Roe, hauled him in, took him ashore. They filled him up with milk and brandy. That didn't mix very well with the salt water and the oil he'd swallowed. He was terribly sick. But in spite of his injuries, engineer Edward Rowe insisted on going back with them to look for Captain Dow. He made them fetch some broom handles and sticks, which they spliced around his broken legs. And at nine o'clock, they all put to sea again to find and rescue the captain if he was still alive. Taking a bearing from Bishop Rock Light, they soon located the tiny spit of rock in Captain Dow. And by midnight... The captain was under a doctor's care on shore. The next day, they set his arms and ribs, and in a few weeks, he was on his feet again. Engineer Rowe didn't fare so well. First, he was taken in a boat to St. Mary's Island in England and placed in a small hospital. But the beds were damp and cold, and he was afraid he'd get pneumonia. 
So he escaped, and with some difficulty, he got on a cattle train bound for Southampton. After resting a day or two, he got to Bordeaux and came to America on the city of New York. He'd lost everything he owned, and there seemed little hope of saving his legs. In Providence, Rhode Island, he was put in a plaster cast, but after three weeks of inactivity, he dug the plaster off with a coal chisel and practiced teetering back and forth for exercise. As soon as he could take a few steps, he was brought to Boston, where he appeared at the shipping office, both legs in splints and a crutch under each arm. He told them he wanted to go to sea. So they signed him up, lugged him aboard, and away he sailed on the Murty B. Crowley. Today, at 72 years of age, Mr. Rowe is retired from the sea. As he looks out of his window by a service flag with four stars on it, he thinks not of the dangers he knew, but of his four stalwart sons who are carrying on through snow and surf and mud and blood in the blazing hell of battle, just as he did when he was young and brave. My goodness, what men these Yankees are.